Welcome everyone to Everything ALS Wednesday's webinar series where we bring the experts to your living room. I'm Lisa Deegan for those who don't know me and I've been with Everything ALS since the beginning as I lost my younger brother John to ALS. So just want to announce for July we have some amazing presenters. On the 28th we have um, Dr. Aaron Gittler from Stanford University who will be talking about expanding mechanisms and therapeutic targets for ALS. And tonight we're super excited to have um, Dr. Kevin Egan from Biomarin Pharmaceuticals Inc. who's gonna be presenting on co contributions from the gut brain access to neural inflammation in ALS. So one announcement before I um, introduce our speaker, as many of you know, biomarkers are so critical for measuring the effects of investigational drugs on people during the clinical trial process and biomarkers can help improve the one to nine success rate of clinical trials and will help to get a better patient outcome. So everything ALS is conducting the largest digital biomarker voice study that will help with an earlier diagnosis of ALS and a more accurate prognosis. So, so many of you have reached out to us and we really appreciate that asking, how can we get involved in everything ALS? We'd love to help, what can we do? So we've been super successful at growing our voice project community participation. Thank you to so many of you in our ALS community um, who have you know, come up with a way, it's come up with a, well, we've come up with a way now for people to get involved and be a part of this voice project. And we want to, because of all the hard efforts moving forward, we want to start compensating for your efforts. So we're looking for ALS research ambassadors to help us recruit people from the ALS community to be part of our voice project study. So you can recruit your family, your friends, people with ALS or PLS with limb or bulbar onset um, and from your social network. So um, as an ambassador, you need to just an, attend an orientation and we're gonna provide an app that's gonna help you track people that you've recruited um, to sign up. So the goal of this really is to keep people active and enrolled in our study. So once a month, they participate um, each week. So that's four times a month and for an entire year, which is 12 months. So you'll be compensated monthly based on the number of participants that you bring in. So I, um, we're gonna be doing it in increments of 10. So for each 10 participants that you get enrolled, you get $100 a month, which equals 1200 annually. And for 20 participants, that's 200 a month, 2,400 an, 2, annually, 30 would be 300 a month at 36 annually, and so on and so forth. So um, as a, just a gentle reminder, our study only takes 10 minutes a week, and all you need is a computer, tablet, laptop, or a smartphone. We're looking for healthy participants for controls. Um, especially males and those di diagnosed with ALS, PLS with bulbar or limb onset. And our study is eye gaze compatible. So the more people that we get to participate in the study, um, the more data that we can collect to help discover digital biomarkers and the more, more we can help our community to be involved in changing the diagnosis length and the prognosis of ALS. So please consider this and you can go to everythingals.org forward slash research. And we're gonna revolutionize the way clinical trials are gonna be conducted in ALS. So if you have questions or you're interested, simply send us an email info at everythingals.org and just put in the subject line, ALS research ambassador. So we look forward to hearing from some of you. This takes a village and we all need to play our part as one in six will be diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease. So now for our speaker, Dr. Kevin Egan. We're super excited. We've heard so many great things about Dr. Egan and read a lot about his research and studies he's done. He's a group vice president, head of research and early development for Biomarin Pharmaceuticals, Inc. Dr. Egan is internationally known for his groundbreaking research and a number of high profile awards, including the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant. His research focuses on applying the knowledge gained in stem cell biology to study the mechanisms underlying ALS and discover the new therapeutic targets. Dr. Egan investigated the connection between genetic and environment, environmental factors in ALS 
and identified an important gut-brain connection, discovering the gut microbiome could influence the severity of disease and it could be a potential target for therapy. His studies also provide new insights on how the most common ALEC genetic mutations contribute to neuroinflammation. Dr. Egan has served as a tenure professor in the Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology at Harvard University, Director of Stem Cell Biology for the Stanley Center of, Psy Center of Psychiatric Research and at the Broad Institute as an institute member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. So Dr. Egan has published approximately 130 scientific articles and holds 13 patents. He served on several scientific advisory boards and has co-founded three biotech companies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Egan. So thanks so much for the opportunity to be, to be with you all today. I, I wanna tell you about some work from my academic group at Harvard. Um, you know, I've just recently joined uh, Biomarin, a mid-sized pharmaceutical company um, in the last nine months. And my academic organization at Harvard University continues to wind down as I transition into that new role. And the subject that I was invited to speak to you about is, in my experience, really informed by some absolutely fantastic work done by a former postdoc in my group who just recently started his own post at um, Case Western Reserve University, Aaron Burberry. So I'll be sharing with you a little bit of that work um, for background, and then we can have a broader discussion on this topic with the time that remains. Um, you know, I, I think we really came at this very much by surprise. I wouldn't say that we intended to work on this axis, but the biology really drove us in this direction. And I think um, that's telling in and of itself. So let's see. All of you know that uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis is characterized by the degeneration of both upper and lower motor neurons. And the key question since this discovery more than 100 years ago by Charcot in Paris has been, what are the factors that underlie this in certain people and not others? And um, we, we know that um, there are many different factors that are associated with this um, degenerative phenotype in patients. One of them is um, changes in the resident um, uh, immune cells in the brain called microglia. And you can see on the left that in um, postmortem tissue from normal individuals, microglia have this kind of radiated spindly shape, but in patients with motor neuron disease, the microglia change their morphology and have this kind of more um, bloated and, and less ramified appearance. And we've wondered for a long time whether or not um, these cells have a direct role to play in the disease or whether or not they're merely changing as a result of the underlying uh, nervous system degeneration that's, that's occurring. Now, um, the other thing that we've really as a field made remarkable progress in understanding over um, recent decades has been the heritable factors that contribute to the development of ALS in some individuals and not others. We know that um, ALS is a highly heritable condition. It's not completely um, determined by heritable factors. Two identical twins don't necessarily have the same um, uh, probability of developing the disorder, but we do know there is a strong genetic contributor in many, many people. And breakthroughs in technology that allow us to um, assess people's genome sequence coupled with um, uh, really medical studies have, have contributed enormously to our understanding of the role that different genes play in this disorder. And what you're seeing here is really the relationship between gene discovery in ALS and ALS um, and time over recent years. And what I hope you can appreciate is that um, it's now been shown that dozens of different genes and uh, a number of changes in each one of these genes can contribute to increasing one's risk for developing ALS. 
And the size in this case of each one of these circles is the likelihood that any individual ALS patient will carry one of these genetic variants. And so you can see that the, the contribution to um, disease in the overall ALS population for any one of these genes is small, but the risk that they confer for any one person is great. So you can actually begin to think about ALS as a whole collection of ultra rare disorders um, where each individual patient's disease is contributed to by a, a different gene or a different constellation of genetic variants. And the thing that we're really up against in trying to solve this condition is um, to um, really try to understand whether or not these genetic effects converge on common biological pathways in which we might be able to intervene and design therapeutics for. And um, really, really, you know, for this reason, many researchers have begun by trying to take on the contribution of genes where a larger number of patients are affected. And so I'm sure that um, in, your, um, in your working group, you found that um, for instance, a large number of patients are really trying to take on the contribution of CNR72 in disease, because as many as 20% of ALS patients overall have a variant in this particular gene that's likely contributing to their motor neuron degeneration. And it was very much with um, that in mind that in my academic lab, we began asking what the function of this gene is that is literally just known by its zip code on, on chromosome 9. Probably most of you know that CNR72 just stands for chromosome 9 open reading frame 72 because its function was unknown. It was just named by the um, Human Genome Project um, by its address on the chromosome. So what's interesting about this gene is that um, all individuals with ALS um, who have a mutation at this locus, broadly speaking, have the same genetic change. There's a uh, repetitive element that's near the beginning of this gene, or the so-called 5 prime N, um, which is variable amongst all of us. Um, each of us carry a, a variable number of repeats of this GGGGCC sequence. Um, but in patients with ALS, um, either because of a founder effect in Northern Europe um, a thousand years ago, or because of a propensity for individuals with more repeats for that to expand, um, um, it's possible for that small number of variable repeats to turn into thousands and thousands of repeats. And we see that picture over and over again in patients with ALS, and it's been associated um, with several different potential contributors to the disorder. Um, people like Aaron Gittler and Paul Taylor have spent a good deal of time focusing on the sort of bad things that happen when that repeat becomes expressed and the ways that it may contribute to uh, motor neuron toxicity. And groups like Biogen have developed antisense oligonucleotides that are designed to reduce the expression of those so-called gain of function or toxic products from the mutation. You've probably heard a lot about these as well. What's so less well understood, although becoming, I think, increasingly clarified, is what is the normal function of the gene that's supposed to be expressed by this locus and for which less is made when this mutation is present. So patients with ALS with this mutation, uh, because of the repeat, uh, make a good deal less um, than a normal person would of this CNR72 um, gene product. So uh, Aaron Burberry in my group set out to ask this question by uh, mutating the orthologous or the mouse version of this gene to ask what would happen. And in a series of um, studies, he both contributed to our understanding with other members of the lab and, um, and answered this important question. And what our group and others have found is that this gene product normally functions along with other biochemical interactors called SMCR8 and WDR41 in controlling um, the, in, the basically intake 
and release of things from cells near the cell surface. And that that may be um, important in regulating how cells degrade um, different types of, of proteins to maintain themselves. And in fact, um, this complex is so important that when Aaron went on to make a mutation in this gene in mice, what he found was that uh, mice that completely lack this gene product um, don't survive um, to uh, a normal lifespan as the control animals that were their siblings were. And that in fact, um, mice that lack just one copy of this gene, which is the equivalent to the human case um, observed in ALS patients where they usually carry one copy of this mutation, um, also have a greatly reduced lifespan. And we and others have spent a good deal of time trying to understand what the root cause of this disorder is. And the most likely contributor to this shortened lifespan is an alteration in innate immune cells that are closely related to the microglia I nodded to you at the beginning of my talk. And um, one of the things that um, draw us, really drew us to this topic that I wanna cover today um, is a experiment that we did in many ways without planning. Um, so as we wanted to study the changes in those animals that led to their death, we not only carried on a large colony of these animals in our animal facility at Harvard, but we also transferred them to another facility at the Broad Institute in Cambridge, uh, where we'd intended to study the um, behavioral and neuromuscular changes that accompanied uh, that premature lethality. The only problem is that when we did that, um, the mice, um, although they continued to suffer at, ALS, uh, at, at Harvard, um, at the Broad Institute, they didn't get sick. And it's important to keep in mind that these were the same scientists studying the animals in both environments. The mice were all related to each other, um, born from common parents and um, brought forward at the same time. And so this you know, didn't have anything to do with the time of the study, the people involved, or the nature of the mice themselves. Instead, it was really a profound effect um, of the environment on the outcome of this experiment. And you can see it's a pretty strong finding with essentially um, none of the heterozygous animals succumbing to early lethality and really um, the knockout mice um, doing very well too. And so, as you can imagine, we've become quite fascinated with the things that would contribute to such a dramatic effect um, because if they were also happening in people with mutations in the CNR72 gene, this would suggest that if you could understand it, you might be able to have a pretty large effect on the course of their disease. So, um, you know, when we looked at this, we found that there were a number of things um, that were dramatically different about the animals at the Broad um, than the historical animals that we'd been um, studying at, at Harvard. And in fact, in almost every way, the disease um, that we'd observed at Harvard was ameliorated in these animals. And we um, dispatched a whole host of different possibilities very early on, like whether or not the diet might be different, whether or not the day and night life cycle of the animals might be different. And, um, and very quickly alighted on the possibility that the underlying differences were actually um, something about the nature of the microbial environment at the two different institutes that might be underlying this difference in survival. I'm gonna tell you about some of the experiments that we've done to confirm that that's true and what their implications might be. One of the first hints of this was to compare um, just the routine veterinarian monitoring of the um, microbes that are living in the feces of the animals that are used as a component of the health checks um, that are done in these rooms. And what you can see is that there are a number of sort of widely accepted um, um, bacteria that are commonly found in rodents in animal facilities at the Harvard facility that were absent at the Broad. And so this really got us thinking about whether or not they could be meaningful contributors um, to the variants that we had seen. Okay. Now what's, what's interesting is that um, this is not the only um, context where these differences have been observed. Um, in fact, this um, 
has been a source of confusion in the literature because while we and investigators at uh, Hopkins saw that animals with um, out C9 or 7 d 2 um, so came to a pretty terrible phenotype, um, individuals at Jackson Labs who had been studying the same mice had reported to the community that their mice were largely free of a phenotype. And so we thought that unraveling this might also give us um, larger context uh, for the rest of the field to understand this apparent discrepancy um, in the phenotype of these animals. And what was really remarkable was that um, there was a very close mapping to the phenotypes that had been observed and the structure of the gut microbes in these different environments, such that there was a close relationship. And you can see this in the orange and the, um, the, the, um, the teal dots with respect to the microbes in animals where, uh, in, in environments where the animals got very sick. And then um, a great distinction between um, those environments where they didn't get sick, um, the, uh, the blue and the red dots here. And so thus far, we've been able to narrow this down to a small number of uh, bacterial species that could be um, uh, potentially responsible um, for this difference. And, um, and we're really you know, in the midst of trying to prove out which one of these bacteria might be, might be responsible. One way that um, we can think about going about doing this is, um, is to think about um, carrying out transplantation experiments where you take the microbes from an environment where the animals are healthy and you transplant them into an environment where the animals are sick and see whether or not that can contribute to improved health and behavioral outcomes in that context. Now, to be able to do that, you actually have to be able to follow the microbes that you're transplanting so that you can see that the experiment worked. And to go about doing that, we had to actually um, bear out some new assays for being able to measure that. So we focused on a small number of helicobacter um, that seem to really differentiate between these two different environments. And we were able to develop an assay, which you see here on the right, in which we could track these helicobacter and, and show that they were present in animals in these pro-inflammatory environments, whether or not it was Harvard or Hopkins, and largely absent from these non-inflammatory environments where the animals survived. So we can now also use this as a test for these potential transplants. And so we wanted to know, could, could we rescue a variety of these phenotypes that are contributing to the neuroinflammatory death of these animals through this type of transplant. So the way that we did this was to wait for animals with um, these CNR72 uh, mutant genotypes to become ill. And we assessed that through behavioral changes and changes in inflammatory markers that are similar to those that are being um, increasingly assessed in ALS. And then we enrolled these animals into a study in which we first um, gave them antibiotics to clear out their, um, uh, uh, their, um, their gut microbes. This allowed us to ask whether or not these microbes that we would in the future transplant would be hypothesized to have a protective or a damaging um, uh, role in this disease process. Now, what was really um, impressive about this is that when we took the mice from the sick environment and just gave them antibiotics to clear out um, their gut microbes, this largely copied the effects of growing up those animals in a healthy environment. And this gives us a clear message that it's not so much that the bacteria from the good environment are protective, it more suggests that the bacteria from um, the environment where the animals get sick are really dramatically contributing to the disease because eliminating them in that pro-inflammatory environment um, um, is being helpful. And you can see that here in their motor performance, but that's also borne out in other um, endpoints like um, the behavior of their inflammatory neutrophils, where here you can see also 
um, treating with antibiotics really rescued this effect. So it's really leading us to believe there's something in certain environments that kind of turns on a, a bacteria in certain environments that turns on this inflammatory biology that um, animals that lack this gene product are, are sensitive to. This also contributes to um, the formation of uh, markers of uh, autoimmune reactions in these animals, which we can measure through these um, autoantibodies. And there was a whole host of, of immune responses around cytokine biology that were all dramatically improved by this kind of intervention. So um, we also found that this had big effects on the brains of these animals. And that if we um, treated animals with antibiotics, that removing these inflammatory gut microbes um, in these um, animal environments where the animals got sick um, dramatically affected endpoints of neuroinflammation and, um, and changes in microglia in this environment. In fact, one, one of the things that we, that we found that was quite dramatic is that in these environments where um, these pro-inflammatory microbes are present, those microbes in that particular genotype or that particular mutant context actually change the immune system sufficiently that those activated immune cells are driven into the brain. And you can see that, um, that when we treat these animals with antibiotics, we can substantially reduce that effect on the right-hand side. So um, this has effects also on the resident cells in the brain, these microglia that I, that I alluded to. So this is, I think, important because it really indicates that um, you can toggle the biology um, of these particular resident immune cells um, by having this peripheral effect in the gut and the activity along this gut brain axis um, is having a pretty strong effect on um, modulators of disease processes in, in the brain. Now there is a major caveat to this sort of experiment and that is that the broad spectrum antibiotics that are being used, of, of course, um, as pharmacological agents can be working in a variety of different ways. And so we wanted to actually really prove that it was the gut microbes um, that are contributing to this. And the methods that are increasingly used um, to bear this out are to actually um, perform fecal transplants where you transiently treat mice with antibiotics to clear out their guts and then basically replace their resident microbial communities in the gut with microbial communities from another environment. And so we did that to more directly test um, the, the role of um, microbes in, in, in these different, um, different settings. So basically here the experimental setup is to take my simile, wait for them to um, uh, become ill, then treat them briefly with antibiotics just so that we can successfully either retransplant in the microbes from the pro-inflammatory environment or replace them with microbes from a protective environment and then follow the animals. And, and again, we used this um, uh, measurement of the helicobacter bacteria um, from these different environments to actually look at success, okay? And so what you can see here is that in the Harvard environment, um, if we retransfer the Harvard feces into those animals, we can um, detect the successful reconstitution. But um, after curing those animals of the Harvard feces, if we put the feces from in, uh, animals at the Broad Institute into those mice, um, you can see that those animals remain free of um, this helicobacter strain. And that, that's, you know, that picture is broadly representative of the overall community in those animals. So we can do broader sequencing of all the microbes, which you see here. And, um, and you can really sort of see that the, um, the mice in the Harvard um, facility are very similar in this matrix and are all grouping together with the mice transplanted with these Harvard microbes. And um, in contrast, when we take um, animals from um, the Broad Institute and look at, at their microbes, 
you can see the ones that received the um, transplant from fecal material from the broad look very similar to them. Okay. Now, along with that, there are also um, strong changes in phenotypes. So there are a number of inflammatory cytokines that I mentioned earlier that become activated in these animals as they become ill and, uh, and making this um, fecal transplant significantly reduces the abundance of almost all of those, um, those cytokines. We can also follow along this effect on um, peripheral neutrophils. And you can see here that um, we really um, uh, begin to bring down, uh, we really begin to bring down um, the inflammatory nature of these um, cytokines and bring them closer to controls relative to the um, control transplanted animals. We also reduce the abundance of these um, signs of autoimmune attack on the body and, um, and in, in general improve the health of those animals. So we've been trying to figure out what the mechanism is that's responsible for this effect. And it actually seems that the most likely culprit is an activity of immune um, um, of um, immune modulation of bacterial components directly on a class of innate immune cells called myeloid cells, um, which are very closely related to microglia in the brain. And we carried out some experiments where we actually took the microbial milieu from those different environments and put them directly on this class of immune cells. And what you can see is that when you um, expose those immune cells to just media, it doesn't really have much of an effect of activating them. But when you treat them with um, uh, feces from Harvard, regardless of their genotype, you see this strong activating effect. Okay? And there's less of this effect when you treat them with feces from the broad. Okay? And what's really striking about this is that you also see that this effect of the pro-inflammatory Harvard feces is in fact greater when you lack the C9 or 72 gene product, which is here. And, um, and you know, this is sort of a dose dependent effect and you, you, know, you can eventually um, uh, stimulate this pathway also in the mutant animals from, with fecal material from the road. So basically what we think is going on is that normally you know, your gut um, is holding these uh, mi microbes at bay but your immune system is constantly sampling that environment and, um, and responding to that environment, particularly this class of myeloid cells, and, and that that participates broadly in immune homeostasis. But when um, C9 or 72 um, levels decline because of this mutation, um, depending on your environment and the nature of your gut microbes, at least if you're a mouse, um, you can begin to have an inflammatory reaction to a microbial community that those who have normal CNR of 72 levels would not negatively react to. And that that can really shift your um, inflammatory state um, towards a diseased state. So um, that's really what I wanted to share with you today. And I think if we think about the conclusions and implications of this, um, one wonders whether or not the, um, the fact that some people who have CNR72 mutations um, becoming ill and others not might have to do with their environment and, um, and their microbial communities. Um, we know that in large pedigrees, there are lots of people with CNR72 repeat expansions that live a normal lifespan without developing ALS. And there's others that become very, very sick. And this is one very credible contributor to that. It's also quite striking that recent studies have suggested that one of the things that may contribute to the age at which you become ill, if you have CNR72 mutation, are aspects of um, the genetics of your immune system. It's also very clear that if you look at the um, health charts of people who develop CNR72 ALS, that um, they, as a class of people, are much more likely to have had an inflammatory disease before they were diagnosed with ALS um, than, um, than other ALS patients. And so it's, um, it's really, I think, conceivable that there is a relationship between these phenomena, not just in mice, but also in humans. 
and, um, and Aaron and our colleagues at um, MGH are quite interested in um, continuing to explore this biology and to, um, to better understand it. So I hope you found my presentation interesting. I'm sorry about the technical delays at the beginning, but I am more than happy to answer any questions you might have about um, CNR72 ALS broadly, um, therapeutic options in ALS, and you know where we are in trying to understand this gut brain axis in the disease. Well, that's wonderful. First off, thank you, Dr. Egan. Um, I'm gonna actually have you unshare your screen so that we can uh, get to answer these questions. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the Everything ALS team members. Um, I, like Lisa, joined Everything ALS because I lost my dad. Myself, as well as Aiden Navarre, who is also here, will be asking a few questions that we have. And if anybody has questions to add to the chat, please feel free to do so. I um, just want to make sure that Aiden's, yep, I'm muted. Our first question uh, says, based on your research with the mice, how soon do you believe this type of testing will be completed on ALS patients? So a large consortium of um, um, physicians at MGH and Brigham and Women's Hospital are in the process of carrying out the comparable experiment in humans where they catalog the microbial um, constituents of a large number of people who are not sick and who are. And they're broadly asking the question, um, is there a difference between healthy people and people with ALS? I think that's an important question to ask. Another question that they will eventually go on to ask is, is there a difference by what your genetic makeup of, of your body is, not just what the genetic makeup of your microbes are? And um, that will, I hope, shed some more light but I think the key experiment that really needs to be done is to look in families where um, the CNR72 mutation is being inherited and to really look at the gut makeup of people who have gotten sick and those that are older and have the mutation and have not. Um, I think that's really the, the difference that needs to be plumbed um, and there is a natural history study of ALS families that have the CNR of 72 mutation that's underway. And my understanding is that, um, that efforts at MGH are in place to try to um, support collection of fecal samples in that context. That's the study that really needs to be done. Um, there's a hope that the first study will lead to an early clinical study of fecal transplantation in ALS. But we really need to know um, what the comparable microbes are um, in human to those that I described to you in mouse in order to be able to mount a therapeutic intervention that would have a chance of working. So that's kind of the key, the key next step scientific question and what it will take. But I think the, um, there's no doubt the ALS community is gearing up for this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aiden, and I'm also going to be moderating the session. I'm a student ambassador, rising senior at USC. And um, yeah, our next question is, what was the color code in the slide with the mutations? I think that was the graph with the plot um, showing the mutations increasing. Yeah, so I, well, there, 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 lot, sorry, a lot of graphs with different color codes, but if it was the one at the end where I was talking about the, the interactions between um, the microbial components and cultured immune cells. Um, there were a couple of different um, color contributors there. I think the, the, the main one is, oh, oh, the one at the beginning with all the mutations. Yeah, there the color code really referred to um, a related issue around whether or not those genes only contribute to ALS or whether or not they also contribute to another related disorder that many of you will be familiar with called frontotemporal dementia. And um, the, the color coding indicated whether or not there is, a, is evidence for those gene mutations contributing into both of these nervous system disorders or not. Yeah. Other questions? Um, can you elaborate on the environmental changes that caused ALS in the, in the two mice studies? I know you said in terms of like the 
bacterial and, and those environments specifically, but was there anything else in terms of diet or, or how that came to be? Yeah, I think that the, you know, the antibiotic studies and the gut microbe studies bring it pretty squarely onto the microbial constituencies. But you do wonder, you know, what are the factors that lead to those kind of microbial communities being in some environments, not others, right? So I, for instance, showed you that there were these two labs, our lab at Harvard and a lab at Hopkins, who actually had mice that had rather similar microbial communities in them, right? And then there's two other labs, which also had kind of similar microbial communities, not completely identical, but somewhat related. And so there's likely something that's in those environments, which is contributing to, um, you know, is contributing to that environment. It could just be that, um, you know, the mice that were used for the study all came from, you know, a common environment and those microbes have been, um, you know, passed from mother to child over many, many different generations. And there are historical links to those facility and their animals that we just don't understand, right? Um, you know, that's one potential explanation. But there could also be other dietary or aspects of the bedding um, in the animals that contribute to um, the likelihood for one particular community arising or another. And that's why I think it's so important to get to the answer of whether or not there's a similar difference in patients because you need to get to those lists of bacteria that might be contributing to these changes in patients. And really, you know, I think um, face down that um, in, in humans before you really begin to wonder what are the things that we could do um, besides fecal transplant to, um, you know, change our microbial constituents for the negative or the positive in, in, in this context. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, our next question comes from the chat asking, is it possible that um, no ALS is actually sporadic or all ALS has a genetic mutation at its core? Yeah, it's a great, it's, it's a great question. Um, we don't know for sure. You know, I mean, I think um, the fact that there are quantifiable environmental effects leads you to believe that there are at least things out there that make a pretty big difference. And, um, you know, and I think we now know there's a significant association between, you know, being a veteran and um, developing ALS. We know there's a significant association between smoking and your risk of developing ALS. Um, you know, and so these, um, these could be, you know, underscored by other genetic changes that relate, um, but, um, you know, I think these support the view that there are things that we could do to contribute or protect ourselves from our genotypes that matter um, in many cases, um, while acknowledging that for a lot of individuals, there's likely to be a genetic change, which is certainly contributing to their risk for developing the disease. And, and some of these are as close to determining as, uh, as possible, like mutations in SOD1. Um, how is the introduction of fecal matter post-antibiotic treatment different than introducing pro or prebiotics post-antibiotic antibiotic intervention? Yeah, it definitely feels from having done now a lot of these studies um, that sooner is better for the probiotic intervention. And that, um, and there may be a, a variety of reasons why this is, um, you know, um, it, it's very clear that clearing out all the gut microbes is very protective. And so, you know, it may be that just like a hard reset or eliminating all signal to this pathway for a while may be, may be beneficial and better in this particular animal context relative to 
you know, a shift from one constituency to another, okay? In other words, once you've kind of had this negative reaction to your gut microbes, it, it, it is clear that what the microbes are in an ongoing way is contributing, but just the total load of microbes that you have may also be helping to, to, to propagate the condition. I hope that that gets to a, you know, a specific answer to the question. That's how we're thinking about it right now. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, another question from the chat is asking if there is any benefit to people who already have ALS to reduce inflammation, such as eating an anti-inflammatory diet. Yeah, I think so. You know, I mean, I think that, um, you know, for many, many, many years, we didn't really realize um, that multiple sclerosis was an autoimmune condition. And, you know, now, immune modulators or frontline therapeutics for that condition. And, you know, it may be that we just haven't tapped into, um, you know, uh, enough of a mechanistic understanding of um, ALS to be able to, um, you know, provide a helpful intervention. Um, I think that it's very unlikely to be harmful to try to do that. And um, the more mechanistic experiments that are done around immune system changes in ALS reveal that they are quite substantial. And while we don't completely understand the relationship to motor neuron disease, you know, if, if you choose a, um, a, a regimen that doesn't have too much downside risk in healthy people, you know, you're very unlikely to make matters worse in ALS. That makes sense. You spoke about fecal transplants um, in terms of the mice, and I know that they are used in other disease processes. Has there been any suggestion for, that this should be occurring in ALS patients? Yeah, and in fact, um, the investigators at, at MGH, at Mass General Hospital, have been contemplating a small study um, to think about transplants like these. And they've not been initiated, but they're they're working towards that. Great, that's great to hear. Um, I don't know if this has been asked already, but uh, the helio bacteria in in this uh, in this presentation is this the same thing that causes uh, digestion and heart problems in people? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, so um, some of you may very well know that. Um, Helicobacter was identified as a causative agent in ulcers. And, you know, people just felt like it was stress that was the problem for many, many years. And there's a famous physician who proved that Helicobacter was, a class of Helicobacter was responsible for causing ulcers by doing the Koch's postulate experiment on himself, where he, you know, gave, you know he ingested Helicobacter and gave himself ulcers. And that completely changed the paradigm of treatment for um, that, that condition. And so these are actually in mice, yes, a related uh, family of bacteria that can act in an inflammatory manner. That's interesting. And, and hopefully as time goes on, we can find more information about these other gut bacteria and see if maybe they are connected and related as well. Um, speaking of, can you maybe discuss how patients could maybe get their gut microbiome tested and analyzed and how often the, the recommendation is to do so? Yeah, well, you know, um, there's, you know, we haven't substantial, you know, these, these are, I think, persuasive experiments in the mouse, but they don't, um, but, you know, there's still a good deal of work to be done in human um, that is now justified to be done based on the findings from these animal experiments. And, and we should move into that rapidly, I feel. The, um, you know, those differences will need to be substantiated in humans um, and supported in humans to really, I think, um, drive you in this direction. You know, it, it may also be that in different forms of ALS, depending on the cause, you might want to modulate this biology differently. And, um, you know, we have to recognize that not all forms of ALS are created equally. And 
you know, one, I, I, I firmly believe that one of the challenges that we've had is that we carry out mechanistic studies on mice and cells that have ALS caused by a particular mutation, but then we take those ideas and the therapeutics that come from them and we test them in all comers, even though we know that um, there are different beginnings to the story of ALS in each of those people. Um, so, you know, we should just be mindful that the participation of this biology in an ALS patient that has an SOD1 or a fused and sarcoma mutation may be different from the effects here. Awesome. That's great to hear. Um, another question is, uh, do you believe that the gut brain component could play a role in sporadic ALS? Say that one more time. Sorry. Uh, like okay. the, <laughs> yeah, the, I think the gut brain component, how does that play a role in um, sporadic ALS? Like, do you believe personally? Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, so, so first of all, a substantial fraction of quote sporadic ALS patients have CNR72 mutations um, and they're sporadic because, um, you know, their parent who had the mutation didn't get sick, right? And that's kind of case in point here that, um, that there may be some differences in each individual's experience and their likelihood of getting disease. Um, but for everybody else, we don't know. And that's exactly what the, um, the group at uh, Brigham Women's and MGH is maybe setting out to do through this cataloging of the gut microbes. That kind of perf perfectly leads into our next question. Do you believe that this could down the line become a module for disease diagnosis or progression in terms of um, monitoring the gut flora of people who either may be at risk or um, have some kind of genetic component? Yeah, I mean, these natural history studies will have a lot to say about that. And um, there's a large natural history study ongoing in Miami of um, families with mutations in SOD1. And I'm sincerely hoping that our study will inspire them to look at the gut microbes of those families um, as um, you know, people age and go from being healthy, but with the mutation to being ill with the mutation. And um, you know, as you look out to the CNR72 community, um, there'll be similar thinking. And there, the large natural history study is in at MGH. And there they'll be asking, you know, are there differences in gut microbes between people in the same family? And does that have any relationship to whether or not you eventually develop ALS? Um, you know, that, that's really the, those are the, those are the places where support for this kind of work really needs to be bestowed. Awesome. So are there any certain types of probiotics that seem to have productive qualities? Yeah, I think it's too certain, you know, here, um, you know, given the number of mice that we had to transplant um, to be able to um, power ourselves to detect the change in behavior, we didn't have the opportunity to try a bunch of cocktails in the mouse model. And um, it's something that, um, that uh, Aaron really intends to do in his own academic lab now. So stay tuned for that. Um, in terms of the fecal transplant, a question from the chat was, is there any expedited fecal transplant risk if we were to make that a faster study for humans? Um, what are the risk benefits of something like that? Well, I think you definitely want to talk about it with your physician. And, you know, the, the, the benefits, of course, could be food poisoning if you were to get a fecal transplant from, you know, a, a non- in a non-regulated way, or that's not something I would try at home. But, um, but the methods for doing that are becoming increasingly established. And there are a number of commercially available products and maybe some things that you can get off label um, that you could discuss with your physician. But I think the bigger problem is that, you know, until we really identify what microbes may be contributing to this effect in people, 
you'd be at risk to shifting your gut constituents to something that could be worse um, until we know that. And so that's just something, you know, I suppose if you already have early stages of disease, it's not gonna, you know, um, you're unlikely to make it worse, but I suppose you might. And um, that, that would be the only thing to consider. Great, specifically pertaining to the study of the heliobacteria um, transfer. Um, one way was to transfer the bacteria through fecal implants in mice. Is there another way to introduce it? And if so, what is the subspecies of heliobacteria that had the largest positive effect? Yeah, um, there were a couple of helicobacter variants that were there and that were contributing likely negatively, but we still haven't yet separated their influence from other bacteria that differ from the two environments. And that's something that Aaron is now funded to do in his own lab to try to separate those effects. It's not so easy, you know, it depends, you know, the, the way that we're going about this is to actually make colonies of animals that are completely free of germs. And then to transplant individual bacterial species into them and compare those head to head. So it's going to take a little bit of time and effort. And I'm going to have to unfortunately depart in just a minute. Yes, we, I was just about to say this, this next one will be our very last question because we want to make sure we respect your time. Um, do you know of any trials uh, that people could participate in currently for um, gut brain connection or gut microbiomes? No, but there are lots of trials that are out there where people are um, trying to broadly modulate this inflammatory biology that um, are enrolling. Like, you know, one example is raw, raw pharma slash UCBs. Um, uh, clinical trial, which I believe is part of the Healy Center platform trial. Um, you know, if you're interested in this biology, um, that might be an interesting one to contemplate. And certainly if I was a CNR-72 patient, I'd be quite interested in that, that approach. Um, you know, obviously if you have a mutation in SOD1, I'd be doing absolutely everything I could to get a hold of Topherson, right? I mean, and now for people who have mutations infused in sarcoma, the ionis compound that Neil Schneider and Bob Brown have been working on um, sounds like it has the kind of the properties that you'd be looking for. Um, we're still waiting, I think with bated breath as a community on the clinical data from the C9R72 biogen trial to understand whether or not um, reducing the effects of these um, gain of function products is actually useful. And that's one to watch. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, the different options within the, um, um, you know, within the, um, the platform trial at the Healy Center, that's a great thing to get into. And, you know, those clinical trials are all very closely um, examined and um, the biological basis for them is, is really checked um, carefully by an expert committee before um, those programs are allowed to go forward. So you might take a look at the Niels platform trial as, as a great place to, to check out if you're looking for opportunities. Absolutely. Well, we want to thank you so much, Dr. Egan, for coming and joining us today. This was a lot to um, absorb, and I know, including myself, we'll have to listen to it again to make sure that we gained all the information. Um, so we really appreciate your time and your expertise and look forward to all the things that continue to come out in your next adventure, as you <laughs> spoke of in the beginning. For everyone else on the call, uh, we want to open to our open forum. This is the time where you can chat and ask questions and we'll take everybody off mute, but we wanna say a nice thank you and goodbye to Dr. Egan. And I, we hope you have a, a good rest of your evening. Thank you, bye everybody. Thank you, thank you very much.